Welcome to 10 Minute Filler Friday, where I teach you how to play a game in 10 minutes or less, or maybe more, but we'll see. Today, we are learning how to play Rolling Realms from Stonemaier Games, who provided me with a copy of the game. So let's put 10 minutes on the clock and get right into it. Rolling Realms is a 1-6 to six player game in which you compete against the other players to earn the most stars in a series of mini-games over the span of 3 rounds. To set up, give each player a set of cards. There should be 13 in total with 11 being realm cards, 1 resource card, and 1 score pad. If you're unsure, each set is color coded so you can have players choose a color to ensure that they are getting each of the cards they require to play the game. Also give each player a dry erase marker and eraser pad and place the two dice in the center of the table. At the beginning of each round, any one player shuffles their realm cards and randomly draws and reveals three cards and places them face up on the table in front of them. Each other player then finds those same three cards from their sets so that all players are using the same set of cards in a round. Each round consists of nine turns with players taking turns simultaneously. At the start of each turn, any player will roll the two dice and share the results with all players. Each player will write the rolled number on their scorecard in the first available spaces, reading from left to right. This allows you to keep track of how many turns have been played throughout the round and, more importantly, how many turns you have left. Once the dice are rolled and recorded, you can then turn to your three realms and activate them using the values that were rolled. Each die counts as one activation for a total of two activations per turn. You may use each die only once, each in a different realm, which means you may not activate the same realm more than once per turn. There is a caveat to that, which will be explained shortly. If you have any resources and you wish to spend any amount of them, you may spend them before, after, or in between activating your realms. More on resources in a little bit. If for whatever reason you cannot use a die as rolled in any realm, you may instead gain a resource. After 9 turns, the round is over. Note the number of stars you earned that round on your scorecard. You'll then count each of your unspent resources and score an additional .1 star. Then erase everything else on your score and resource cards. Set aside the realms from that round as they will no longer be used. Then randomly select 3 new realm cards as before. After the third round, proceed to the endgame scoring and the player with the most points wins. Now normally, that's where the video would end, as that's basically how you play Rolling Realms. Roll two dice, record the dice on your scorecard, and then use those dice to activate realms. However, each of the realms themselves act and play differently. So let's take a look at how you'll be able to use dice in realms and how you'll score stars. Starting with Between Two Castles, for this realm card, you'll have to fill squares from the bottom up. However, numbers on top must be lower than those below. When you complete a column, gain the resource or resources depicted at the top of the column. There are also two doors, one on each castle, and the doors are considered filled. For example, on the third turn of the round, a 2 and a 5 was rolled. I could use the 5 in my first castle, but only in the space here. However, I really want those two hearts. I can't use the 5 for that because it needs to be lower than the one below it, which it's not. But I can use the 2, which is exactly what I'll do for this. In between two castles, you'll score 1 star for each completed row, not column in a castle. Which means each castle has the potential of being worth 3 stars. Here, we have the Charter Stone Realm. To activate this realm, either use the number on a roll die to mark a building and gain the resource allocated to it, then note the other roll die on the corresponding crate. It can't be adjusted using resources, and the noted die remains available to use in another realm. Or, when one or more crates are filled, instead use the number on a roll die to mark all crates matching that number. On turn 6 of the round, this is what my Charter Stone realm looks like. I've marked off these buildings on the top and gained the resources, then place the other rolled die in the crate below. I've got three threes and a five. On this turn, I've rolled a three and a four. I'll go ahead and use my three to mark off each crate that has a three in it. 
when scoring the Charterstone Realm, score one star per marked crate. In order to activate the Between Two Cities Realm, fill a square with a number. However, in Between Two Cities, identical numbers can't be orthogonally adjacent. For example, they can't share a side, but diagonals are okay. Then, when you complete a row or a column, gain the resources indicated. Scoring between two cities is a little trickier than most other realms. For this realm, you'll score stars equal to the lower score of your other two realms used this round. That being said, the score cannot be higher than the number of filled squares in between two cities. So although my lowest scoring realm may be four stars, because I only activated my Between Two Cities realm twice, the most I can score in this realm is two. To activate Euphoria, mark one number in either area, then gain a resource or star based on the sum of all marked numbers in that area. For example, on my first turn, I marked off this two. Because the sum of that area is two, I gain a coin resource. Next turn, I mark off the three. This time, the sum is now five, which means I score a star. This works independently between both areas. If the rolled dice make a pair, you may mark that number in both areas and gain the resources and or stars for both. If you do this, the second die still remains available to use in other realms. This turn, I rolled two sixes, which means I can use them in both areas of this realm. I'll place one in this area, bringing the sum to 11, which means I gain a pumpkin and a heart. But in this area, my sum is only 6, which means I gain another star. In my little scythe, you'll activate it by marking off a number in a hex. When you do, gain the corresponding resource, either pumpkin or heart. Gain a coin when you complete a matching pair of hexes. So if I were to mark off this 2 on one turn, it would net me a pumpkin. On the next turn, another two was rolled, so I can mark it off over on this side. When I do, not only do I gain the heart, I also gain a coin for marking off both twos. Score two stars each time you gain the sixth resource of any resource type on your card for this round. Resources spent during the round are still considered gained. If throughout the round we had seven pumpkins, four hearts, and six coins, this realm would score four stars. Moving on to Pendulum, in order to activate and use this realm, either outline an octagon using any rolled number, however when doing so, you do not get the resources, or, instead of outlining an octagon, you can mark a specific number in an hourglass. When you do, gain the contents of all outlined octagons when you complete an hourglass. Let's say that on two different turns I marked off a star, and this octagon here that will provide me a pumpkin and a heart when I complete an hourglass. I also marked off the 4 inside this hourglass here. On this turn, a 5 was rolled, so I can mark that off in this hourglass here, and because that hourglass is now complete, I gain everything above that I had previously outlined, which in this case is a star, a pumpkin, and a heart. As you might have already guessed, for scoring, when completing an hourglass, score stars for each outlined octagon with a star in it, for a possibility of 6 stars. In order to activate the Society Realm, fill cards in any order with a maximum of one number per card. That being said, multiple cards can have the same number. The trick to the Society is that each card number must be lower than the number directly above it. So, highest on top, lowest on bottom. When you complete a row, you gain the bonus resources. In the Society, you score one star per set of completed cards. A set of completed cards is a mini card pyramid, meaning one card on top and two cards on bottom. Mini cards, as you can see, appear in multiple sets. You may also notice that that only gives you a total of five stars. If you fill all the cards, then you gain the sixth star. In order to activate the Scythe Realm, mark a number in the top or bottom row. When you mark the top row, you gain the resource indicated, but in order to mark the bottom row, you must spend resources. That being said, instead of marking the bottom row with a die, you may mark the top row and gain that benefit. Then, 
pay the cost of the corresponding bottom row and also mark that bottom number. For example, with this two, there are a few things that I could do with it. I can mark it off on the top row and gain the heart. I can mark it off on the bottom, pay the coin and gain the star. Or I can mark it off on the top, gain the heart, then pay the cost directly below it, marking that die off as well and gaining the star. As you've probably guessed, you gain a number of stars equal to the amount of marked off dice on the bottom row. Here we have the Tapestry Realm and one of my favorite Stonemeyer games. In order to activate it, spend a die to get the shape that corresponds to it. Fill in a full shape, rotating and flipping as you see fit. There is no limit to the amount of times you can use a shape in a single round. When placing the shape, it must fit inside the grid and can't overlap with completed squares, including the brown ones that have already been pre-filled. Gain the resource in the background of a big square when completed. If we take a look here, I've got a four I can use. That gives me this shape and I'm free to flip and rotate it in any way I want. So I will think I'll place it here, gaining the pumpkin underneath for the completed big square. At the end of the round, score one star for each completed big row and column. As you can see, there are three columns and three rows. Next up is Wingspan. When using a die to activate it, fill a square with a number moving left to right within each individual tableau, or in this case, bird. Then gain the resource below that square. When scoring the Wingspan realm, score one star for every filled square with a star below it, for a total of three. However, you score one additional point for every completed bird whose sum equals its wingspan, which is the number printed on the bird card. If we take a look at what we have here in the realm now, you can see that we score three stars because all three bird cards have been completed. However, I score one additional star for the middle bird because the sum of the three filled in squares below it totals 12, which is the wingspan that I had to meet. Just know that you can go under or over that wingspan, you just won't receive the additional bonus star. And lastly, we have the Viticulture Realm. When activated, either gain a grape by spending the die and outlining it, and then gain the resource under it. Or, use the sum of exactly one die and the value of at least one previously gained grape, crossing it off to show it's been used, in order to fill a wine order equal to or less than that sum. For example, you can see here that through the round, I've crossed off the one, two, and five grape. I've rolled a six and a three for this turn, and I would like to use one of those dice to activate this realm and fill a wine order in order to gain two stars. With the dice I've rolled, I have a lot of options. I can mark off either the three or the six grape to use later and gain that resource but I think I would like to fulfill a wine order instead. I'll use the six die to activate the realm and cross off the five grape to show that it's been used. Combine the five grape with the value of my six die, that makes a sum of 11. Therefore, I can cross off the 10 wine order or the 11. I think for this turn, I'll go ahead and cross off the 11 and gain the two stars. And obviously for scoring viticulture, every time you complete a wine order, you score two stars for a total of six. That completes all the realms. However, before we get into end game scoring, I'll first touch on resources because there's actually quite a bit that can be done by spending the resources you gain throughout a round. Each realm features ways to earn resources. When you gain a resource, circle it. When you spend a resource, cross out the resource you've already circled, making sure not to erase it completely. You may spend resources at any time on a turn, including before you use the two rolled dice, or immediately after earning the resource. You may also spend any number of resources you want as many times as you want on any turn. So what can you do with resources? Well, starting with pumpkins, if you spend two, you can adjust a single die by plus or minus one. So a four could become a three or a five, a five could become a four or a six. I think you get the point. However, a one cannot be changed to a six and a six to a one. This will come up later, but you may also adjust a die that you created with hearts or coins. If you instead decided to spend three pumpkins, 
you could do the exact same thing we just talked about with the addition of being able to activate a realm that has already been activated this turn. Now, if you remember from earlier in the video, you normally can't activate the same realm more than once per turn, but spending three pumpkins lets you do just that, along with adjusting the value plus or minus one. That being said, if you want to spend three pumpkins for the added benefit of being able to activate a realm that you've already activated, then you're free to do so without adjusting the value of the die. For hearts, if the roll dice or a pair, spending two allows you to gain a die of that value. For example, if I roll two sixes, I could spend two hearts to gain another six. So in total, I would have three sixes that I could use to activate realms. However, the die you gained can't be used in either of the realms that you've activated this turn, with the exception of spending three pumpkins to do just that. Spending three hearts allows you to gain a die of the same value of either of the rolled dice. If the rolled dice are a three and a five, you could spend three hearts to gain either an additional three or a five. Otherwise, everything else from spending two hearts remains the same. In either case, this gain die can be adjusted by spending two or three pumpkins as if it were a real die that had been rolled. If the sum of the rolled dice is seven, you can spend two coins to gain a die of the same value as either of the rolled dice. Much like the creation of a new die by spending two or three hearts, this new die can't be used in either of the other realms you activate this turn. Again, unless three pumpkins are used on the newly created die. And lastly, you can spend any number of coins to gain a die of that value. So. Spending three coins gets you a value three die, four coins for a value four, and so on. And once more, this newly created die can't be used in either of the other realms you activate this turn. Again, unless three pumpkins are used on the die. After the third round, add up your score from each round. The player with the most stars is the winner. If there's a tie, the tied player with the highest score in round three is the winner. If still tied, refer to round two, then round one. If still tied, then I guess it was just never meant to be, and the tied players share the victory. And there you have it. That was how to play Rolling Realms from Stonemeyer Games. Go ahead and smash that subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified on any future videos. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Links for everything in the description below. But until next time, thanks for watching, and happy gaming.